had no right. No, I don't drink in the morning. Hi, that's good news. The Norman Sideshow. Welcome to Sonoman Sideshow, recorded at Grim Reaper Studios, located somewhere at the base of the beautiful Blue Mountains in Eastern Oregon. And now, here's your host, Les, the Showman Kinnear. <laughs> that, was, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Hey, Season 2, Episode 1, I have the one, the only, Brad Fairbank. I met this crazy cat 30 years ago, approximately, and uh, I'm going to go through your kind of what I thought your bio would be, Sure, sure. And, and you can correct me along the way, but I think I'm pretty close. So, uh, I would say that you are a former seaman. Yes, heavy on the seam. You are a former master welder. Master welder, yes. yes you actually. are a former master gardener. Uh, currently. Okay, sorry, sorry, my bad. Currently master gardener. Uh, so. You are, I don't know if this is former or currently fishing guide. Uh, former. Okay. Uh, used to be a candle maker. Yeah, absolutely, yes. I forgot about um, that. Um, yeah. of course, a bartender. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, I would say an entrepreneur. There's been other little things, ventures you've done along the way. Yeah. Uh, also, you're a pond builder for I fish. Lo- yeah, you I love doing landscaping. Yeah, horticulture and yeah. Uh, ponds are my thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you were a professional barbecue, or well, a competitor. Competitor, yeah. I, I competed. You competed. Right. Contest. Right. But your day job for the last 30 years has been working in mental health. Correct. And specifically with folks that... Uh, I, I'm not sure the proper terminology these days. Uh, it depends on the uh, day. Uh, mainly it's uh, people with mental illness, um, developmentally disabled type right. folks, criminally insane. Oh, or yeah, now we say, we don't say criminally insane, we say guilty except by reasons of insanity. Okay. So GEI is okay. the correct term. I feel like we could... We're going to be talking about that. Yeah, a lot. yeah, that's that's um, that's a. But before we go down your rabbit hole of your life, uh-huh. you know what we're going to do real quick? We're going to reach out to Southern Texas, Southeast Texas, right. to Pork Chop, and uh, we're gonna we'll start this intro off with his his rap song that I made for him, and uh, we're going to give him a call right here live on the show. Let's we'll see what he has to say. Right. Yo, 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 pork chop, you're live on the <laughs> Sonoman Sideshow. Rock and roll, baby. <laughs> hey, I also have here live in the studio my co host and guest for tonight, Brad Fairbank from Southern Illinois. <laughs> ah, Mr. Fairbank. How you doing? Yes, sir. How you doing, pork chop? Hey. Hey, I'm doing so good, it's not fair to anybody else. Yeah, all right on. I'll tell you that. What's right going on. down? Hey, man, uh, well, you want to know what's going down? I'll tell you what's going down. <laughs> yeah! <sighs> I, I don't know how to feel about this, so no, man. Yeah. I got to talk about the weather. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. I think where we left off in season one. Hey, let me be the first to thank you, or one of the first, to congratulate you on a season one of the podcast. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, wish you the best on season two. And I'm <laughs> I'm honored, and I'm I'm grateful to be here. God bless you. Thank you very but, much. 
I got to bring up the hurricanes. That's where we left off. Okay. If I remember right. Right. And, man, I just I feel bad for them friends and neighbors in Florida. And there's another one, but it don't look like I'm I'm going to be affected here where I'm at. And, right. uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it's a bittersweet symphony. Okay. Okay. But um, uh, hey, that's yeah. it, man. We've been rocking and rolling here. We had a a good summer. It was hot and dry, but this uh, I mean, I don't want to say we had a fall, but I think we had a fall. <laughs> We've had some cool weather. We've had some great weather here in Southeast Texas, man. Praise me. It's been awesome. Great for the, uh, you know, the golf course. Right. If I do say so myself. So you you had a lot of rain, then? No, no. No rain? It's been, uh, it's been dry. We, we had a, this summer, we've had a two-week spell. We, got some rain but it's been real mild normally it's real wet and muggy and hot and all that it's been a real mild summer uh we're feeling some actual season here oh this fall you know cool mornings low humidity (sighs) great for the golf course Right. Great for the golf course. Mm-hmm. Great. Man, I'm ready to go right now. Stop. Let's change <laughs> subject. <laughs> Bro. So you like to Guess who I'm going to see? Guess who I'm going to see? Who? Government Mule. Oh, yeah. Okay. O- October 28th in Houston. Nice. Yeah, my dad's so, a big fan. I I am so excited. What a band. And that's a combination of <laughs> tell us a little bit about them. That's a mix of a couple other bands, right? Yeah, it's, well, you got the Almond Brothers. Yeah. Um I'm not sure who else. <laughs> right. But I mean Hope, I mean, I don't know if I should say this out loud, but <laughs> do it. Does anybody else matter? I mean, right, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a great band! I mean, they're all just master musicians, and you put them together, you just got a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful music. Amen. What do, what do they play? I'm I'm kind of curious. What what kind of music is it? Uh, it it's like a bluesy rock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, like a southern rock type yeah. of thing. Southern rock, yeah. Like Some a Molly Hatchet, Allman Brothers. It's kind of like. I mean, they got the Allman Brothers, of course, because of Warren Haynes, but. I don't know. It's hard <laughs> to explain because they got the rock. That's a good point, Brad. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> Anyways. But, uh, I'm moving on. The local saint, dude. I mean, how about Stevie Wonder? I love Stevie Wonder. Mm. That guy. Yes. I heard uh, Stevie Wonder did Part Time Lover, I guess in the 80s. Yeah. And when you listen to the vocals on that song, it's mind blowing. <laughs> but here in Southeast Texas, man, it's just. I hate to harp on it, but the music scene ain't what it used to be. Okay. I don't know about 
anywhere else in the great country, but God, dang, local music suffered, mm -hmm. and we need to build it back up. Mm -hmm. Get out. And yeah. Anybody listening, get out, support your local music, please. Right, right. That's don't, where it begins. Don't forget to vote. Yeah, that too. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, that's about it. We got Southeast Texas, right? It's been laid back, chill. Right on. Right Nothing on. Nothing exciting. And that's all good news. That's great yeah. news. Well, it's been that's, a it's been a pleasure just talking to you. Well, I've had a blast. I'm, like I said in the beginning, so happy for you, season two. Yeah, I feel like some Emmys are coming my way. Uh, Absolutely. No, wait, they don't do Emmys for podcasts. But anyway, Grammys, Grammys, whatever. Oscars. Yeah, probably an Oscar. Whatever they call it. All right. It's coming to you. I love it. Well deserved. Yeah. Well. well it's, it's, it's been great talking to you. But I got to get back to my getting back. So, uh, it's Pork Chop shining out live from Southeast Texas. Where the roosters can't crow because they done been put in the dumb bone. They said, I don't know where they say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There he goes. That cat. He is a interesting dude. Love that guy. Yeah. He's been he's been waiting all night to do this because, of course, it's two hours. Oh, right. It's a two-hour difference. Yeah. So I think it's two, yeah. So anyways. Sounds about right. He couldn't wait. So thanks for... Uh, doing that with me that was fun uh, but anyways we were going through all this this resume of yours but most recently the, the 30 years that you did in mental health and um, I was thinking maybe you could just start with that like what brought you out to eastern Oregon to work in mental health that oh. you would spend 30 years after yeah. living in Illinois and you were a seaman before that right right you know took the Went out of high school, went into uh, being going into the Navy. Oh. Uh, so kind of just kind of wanted to get my feet wet, figure out what was out there. And I joined the military and found out real quick that that wasn't my my <laughs> thing. Uh, didn't like it. I didn't like being on a boat. Oh. I, didn't, I, did, I didn't like any of it. So anyway, I was doing uh, different odd jobs, doing a welder and working uh, at after a factory. After I got out, yeah. And um, there was an opportunity to come out here, and uh, the parents wanted to start a business, and they wanted to know if I wanted to help out. And I said, you know what? I'm at the end of these dead-end jobs. They're not really going anywhere. Nothing was panning out. It was the 80s. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, everything, the interest rates were out, right? Kind of like it is now. It's right. just, it was just, <laughs> but there was no jobs. Right. So everybody was struggling. Minimum wage was uh, probably $3.35 an hour. You know, if you were making five bucks an hour, you were you were set. But those jobs were just few and far between. So, you know, I took a chance and said, I'll, I'll come out here and see what's going on here out west. And so mainly, I uh, took a took a risk, jumped huge on huge risk, huge risk, sold everything. Um, and you had two babies. And had two babies. Yep, left the wife and the two kids at home, and kind of I jumped on a jumped in my truck and came out here with my father and. He started a business, and I kind of helped out. And shortly after doing that, I kind of realized that that wasn't my thing either. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't like the the nightlife, being up till two in the morning and and dealing with drunks and, <laughs> and uh, the chaos that went along with that. So I kind of started so, uh, reaching out to to do what I was doing there, which was I was a certified welder. So I did a few things that uh, around here, and there wasn't very much welding opportunity here. So I did a couple little jobs, and then uh, one day I was going through, and I went to the employment office, and I was just kind of throwing some stuff out there, trying to see if anything stuck, and I got a call from the Eastern Oregon Training Center. Mm. Man, and I'm like, 
oh, okay, what is, you know, what, yeah, what had, is this? I had no idea what the hell that was, you know, I'm just like, this is weird. And so they gave me a call, and I, I said, well, um, we need you to come out here and do a tour. And I said, all right, give me the address, I'll come out and check it out. I had no idea what was going on. And uh, an old boy came to the door and <laughs> took me and said, I'll take you for, I want to take you for a tour and kind of show you what, show, show you what this place is all about. And then, oh, my God, I never forget walking in that door and all these mentally retarded um, people were the, – the thing that hit me was the smells. When I walked in the door, the smells. And I kind of was set back. I was scared at first. I walked in, and I, I, I'd seen these things, and I'd seen these people that, you know, I'd never really – dealt with them before but looking at them they kind of which was common at that time most of us hadn't right society had put, put them there put them there so yeah. we wouldn't so we have wouldn't have to. to see them yeah so here i is firsthand you know i'm i'm walking off my couch coming down walking through this place and and looking at these these people that honestly looked bizarre and yeah. they looked they looked different, different. and and were drooling and making noises that I'd never heard and mm -hmm. smells that I'd never smelled and, and I'm like what in the hell and so I walked through it and it kind of just oh my god you know I didn't know what to think I didn't yeah. know what to do and I went through the whole tour and came back out and uh, I said all right thanks and I left and I was sitting at the I went home and I was like oh my god what just happened you know it was kind of like a <laughs> right culture shock culture shock I was like wow that was weird and, you know, they they called me up and they said, well, you want to do your interview? And I said, yeah. And I was sitting on the couch in my underwear and they called me up and did an interview. And I remember answering the questions and the best I knew how. Mm -hmm. And they said, all right, be here Monday morning for orientation and do your training. And I'm like, okay, what the hell? I'll give it a shot. Yeah. And I knew it was a state job. So, so it, had to be it was like, okay, this can't be that bad. Right. I mean, really? So... And then they, at that time, they were still putting you through uh, in connection with the college, the community college, the CNA program. Yes. Because you, at that time, you had to be a certified I, I, nursing yeah, assistant. Yeah. It, I had to do like eight weeks of that. Yeah. So before you even went on the floor, you did eight weeks of nursing uh, stuff. And then it was, here you go. Yeah. And uh, you were out there on your own. And so there I was. And I ended up, you know, I've always told everybody, I said, you know, going through life most people don't find the job of their dream or their job that they want yep. most of the time the job finds you and that's a diff that's a perfect example of the job found me i really didn't find that job just, i did not intend to go work with a bunch of mentally retarded people right. and do all that so it kind of found me and i kind of went oh this isn't so bad it was kind of cool um so I just kind of, you know, of course, you, you start out, you get put on the, the shittiest ward there is, and you get the worst jobs there is. And I thought, you know, this is be a, this be a test, and I'm going to try it, and I'm going to work hard and see see where it goes from here. So I did, and and I uh, worked at it, and, and then I kind of got a promotion. I was a lead, and I kind of was running, running things, and I kind of liked that. And that's kind of where you came in. Mm -hmm. And when I first met you, and I remember you coming in, and you were working, and we kind of hit it off, and mm -hmm. we were kind of having a good time, and it was, like, nice to see somebody I could relate to, you mm -hmm. know, and because it was, it was hard work, and it was stressful, and a little bit of humor and fun changed everything. It changed the environment. You had to have that because the environment was, was actually, it was terrible, but having that, it kind of helped you get through it, and... uh and I remember you coming in, and we were doing stuff, and it was it made the day go by a lot faster. We had good time, and uh, I remember you coming in, and there was something went down. I can't remember what was said or something, and you wanted to quit. And I remember setting you down in one of somebody's room in there, and I said, "Don't do it, dude. Don't don't quit. Don't just tough it out." And and you did, and you stuck it out for a while, for a while, <clears throat> and then you know. Yeah, and what a what a place though, what a place oh to grow up, God. which we all did. We grew up at that place. Yep. Which it was a transition from 
the old school 40s, 50s, 60s of the large institutions to warehouse yep. folks with disabilities to, okay, let's just move them out into these group home type things, but this is still run by the state. Right. And it's still going to have a, a feel of the institution, but we're going to really try hard not to. Right. And that's been the battle for so long. Mm-hmm. And and then eventually that place kind of closed, but the same building, the same same campus turned into this new facility and you just stayed on right i right, mean basically right. yeah you know, i just uh the place closed uh shut the doors and i kind of you know i jumped around from different positions there um and kind of moved my way up in the end of that different roles and then when it closed uh you know it was kind of one door closes another one, one opens, opens and that, that's kind of exactly what happened and so this place came up, which is a secured residential treatment facility, uh, the first one of the state. And they decided to do this, and we were kind of like a pilot program, and we had these houses, and they said, let's do it. And so I interviewed for the vocational coordinator there and actually got it. And I've been there since God, 14, 12, 13 years now, I think, since the training center's closed. Mm-hmm. So I've been doing that, um, working with the – you know, not MRDD folks, but with criminally insane individuals and sex offenders and and different different a lot of a lot of wild stuff. But uh, that was kind of a, a learning curve again. But I'd worked with some psych center patients when I was doing vocational too, so I was kind of used to it. And so, you know, I've done that for the last 12, 13 years, and I just recently became the training and development specialist. For the facility, so and and you have thirty years in now, thirty one, thirty one years, right? And it's which, funny you say that because I remember when I first started, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, right. but I remember coming in and all the old guys that mm-hmm. were there, and I looked up to these guys. I mean, mm-hmm. they were like the old school. They were had that so many years, and I was like, man, and I just. I can't believe that they've been there that long and the stories they told. And and now I'm that guy. Now you're that guy. Yep. Now I'm that guy. Yeah. And it's just weird. It's surreal thinking about where we were, where I was. It just seems like it wasn't that long ago. And now I'm that where guy. Where we were and where we are now. Yeah. It, it's like um, Joe McNeely, you know, you brought him up. He was, he was a he was one of the best trainers, mm-hmm. and we were good friends. Good friend of yours, mine, mm-hmm. uh, great guy. But you know, I was working with the program director the other day, and and you know, she said she used the phrase, "I want you to Joe McNeely this." Yeah. And I, that's oh when my it, God. Yeah, it, that's it. Wild. Really hit me. I was like, "Oh my God, I'm Joe McNeely now. Yeah. My job is exactly what his job was." When I started 30 years ago, right, I have morphed into him, and it it, it right. kind of hit me like, oh my god, I this is a weird ride. I, it just it is a weird ride. It, it's and a lot of those guys that were there when we were young are all have passed away. Right. So so that's next. <laughs> yeah, that's what's next. You know, that's, that's what you got to look at too. It's like, oh, yeah. okay, then I'm I'm next. I guess it's my turn. That's where I trip out the most. I yeah. start thinking, wait a minute. So if they're here and I'm there, even though so, I feel like I'm still there, still there, that means I know what's next, exactly. which is this, this, and this. And yes, like, exactly oh, where man. they are. And it's like, ah. so, Exciting. you know, you come to that dilemma, you know, and I'm looking at this going, you know, a lot of people say, well, why aren't you, you know, retired? Um, Man, I just, you know, it, it's, everybody's different. Um. I haven't fulfilled what I want to do, yeah. I guess. And I think I want to kind of play the field and see what there's see, see where this goes. Yeah. And and you know, it's just it's helping me at this time and moment to feel like I'm doing something. I don't know what it is. I feel like all my 30 years or whatever that I've done, I feel like it's my turn to give back the new staff. Right. 
what Joe get, did for me. Mm -hmm. And I really looked up to Joe, and I'll never forget the things that Joe did and, and helped me, and I'll, I'll never forget that. Understanding human behavior. Yes. That's where he specialized. And in relating to people and help, yeah. having people understand the trainings and stuff, and it's like, that's kind of feel like that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and it's a different, you know, it's a different world, of course, um, but it's the same principle. It's the same concept. And so now I'm just looking at that and and it's it's keeping me busy and I'm learning a lot and kind of I it feels good to pass on what I know and it sometimes I don't feel like I know that much but in reality you really do more so than these new people coming in you're sure. like they're just blown away by I can sit and tell stories and and examples like and, and the old like, just like the do. old times would do mm -hmm. and yeah. and you know back in the day we used to do it like this and we mm -hmm. did this and we did that and they're just like sitting there just awe and listening on my stories. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe we did a full circle here. Yep. It's just it's just bizarre to me. But one day I'm going to walk in. I'm going to go. I'm hoping in my mind that I'm going to walk in one day and, and it's just going to hit me. Kind of like Forrest Gump when he was running <laughs> down the road. And he ran and he ran and he ran. And then he just stopped. Mm -hmm. He's done. And I feel like that's. It's going to hit me with it might be this year, might be next year, but it'll it'll hit me and I'll go I'm done. Yeah. And then it's on to something else. The next chapter. The next chapter. Because now you have how many grandchildren? Um four. Five. Four. 1 2 3 4. Yeah. Yeah. But when you came out here it was just you and a couple of little little bitty ones. Yeah, yeah, little guys. So, and yeah. what's weird too is your whole family, you know, your mom and dad came from a whole nother area. I think about that. Like, I moved around a lot up until junior high. Mm -hmm. And then we landed here and we've never really left since. Yeah. And then there's people that, that do the opposite. You know, they, so, I mean, it's interesting to me that you guys came from so far away and now your roots are strong here. Right, and it's it's funny because my mom just visited. She moved back to Illinois. She did the complete opposite, and and she kept. She was here in July, and she we we talked, and she's like, I don't know why you what Pendleton, blah blah blah. I hate it here. It's just you got it's so dry. It's just a yuck. And I, and I and I looked at her and I said, Mom, I said, Yeah, it is. It's all those things. It's not a great place, but you brought me here. <laughs> yeah. And, and now I'm kind of stuck here because my kids grew up here. Right. They had kids. I can't leave them. So I'm kind of like, you know, yeah. just out here. And so it's not a bad place to to live. I mean, it's right. it's not bad. It, it's not great. But it's, it is what it is. And as long as you have your family close by, somewhere close by, I think you can make the best of anywhere you live. That's right. That is absolutely right. And I used to hate, I always, be moving around so much as a young person, I wanted to leave here immediately, you know, yeah. from, and I tried multiple times, but there was always something that, that made me say, well, I'll wait a little bit longer or no, I better, you know, and, uh, but it's funny, just recently I'm like, you know what? This is my hometown. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter where all I've lived, this is it. This is where I built my roots. And, uh, you know, almost I like to, to see you naked. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You like to see almost naked? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of what, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it is what it is, I guess. Well, that's pretty wild. I mean, you know, we've been doing this a long time, this uh, working in mental health and being, we've known each other a long time. And I mean, we've done some weird experiments along the way. Oh, I was, I was telling, I was telling, actually, I was telling a new hire the other day and I was training her and she was, she was a nurse and she's, she's learning all these things. And, and I was telling her about the human experiments mm -hmm. that we did and at the time, you know... Which we learned from Joe, Behavior Mod. Yes, right? So we exactly. tested this constantly. So we, we tested that theory, and we 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 did it several times. Got us in trouble a few times. Yes. But it was fun, and I'd do it again. Yeah. But uh, 
it's you know nowadays you know there'd be shows on it there'd be you know there, yeah. there are shows out there now what we were doing that we didn't have the technology or whatever to do these things but my god we could have made millions of dollars <laughs> yep. the stuff we did going to places and i was telling them about how you would uh uh we'd watch their expression when you would you would talk to someone but you would make an incoherent sentence oh yes and watch their reaction nice. and how they responded to that information yeah and watching their wheels I did it turn time and time again. And it was just, it was priceless. And most of us just agree with what the person says. Yeah. So I would they, say, "Hey, how's it going?" And they would be like, "Yeah, yeah," and, and just would, roll with and they, it and in they public. Would, yeah, and they would smile and and maybe laugh or. And I'm like, or, "There's no way you know what I no, said." No. And and you know we were we are we were in on it. You know yeah. we knew, but it was just it was great. Um, it was great entertainment. And we didn't even know. I mean, we could have went really far with it. All the mm-hmm. all the experiments we did, like uh, I'll never forget the 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 fake poop in the hallway. Mm. Always and, a good one. Oh yeah, watching all the staff come down the hallway, and watching their face, and watching them glance over at that pile of poop on the floor, mm-hmm. and acting like they never seen it. Never seen it. Never. And seen anybody it. who's worked in any sort of healthcare. <laughs> In maybe you know, in the old days, the institutions or large group, uh, large living facilities. I mean, nurses, ser- nursing assistants. I mean, you have a heavy load. Oh, you're busy, oh. and so when you have say five people assigned to you, and then you walk down the hallway and see a fresh turd, <laughs> you're like, who has that group? Who has that group? Because I'm was, taking care of. That was the worst thing you wanted to it hear. It wasn't that. We Who's were, got group three? Yeah. When you heard that, you were in trouble. You knew it was bad. I and hated then you were it. like, oh, God, I got group three. Yep. That means something it, bad happened. Yes. You've got to go deal with it. And this is, this is not a reflection or a, a, a cut on people with disabilities. This is about what it's like to work those jobs. Right. And nobody thinks about those Yeah. Things. Nobody thinks about the things that you you experience except the family members and people that go through it all the time or work in this field so yeah i mean if you heard hey who's got group three you were like ah dang it you knew you were going to be cleaning something up right you could you could you could come down the hall and smell and go back to smells again that's a big thing with me smells you could smell and you knew who did it you did you because knew, you learned the you diets. Learned, you learned their. You we fed knew. them. We, we fed, fed everybody. We everything. Fed our, you, know, you knew we everything. All, we lived together. Yeah. Essentially. So when someone had, you know, a bowel movement, yep, you knew, you knew it was so and so because yeah. the way it smelled. Mm-hmm. Now people, you tell people that, and they're just like, "Are you kidding me?" Yeah. But it was true. You right. you knew. I mean, I wouldn't even have to go in the room and know exactly who it was. Yeah. Or. Yeah. Or the, the thing is, you work with these people and you you help them do things day after day, eight hours a day or longer, and you become one with them. Right. You were you talking know? everything, and feeding, you start. You even start like bathing. Yes, all of it, all every, their personal stuff. Everything from step one all the way to putting them to bed and their medications. Everything. Then every day. One thing you don't see coming is building a relationship. With nope. one, nope, a person that lives there. Yep, and you're like, next thing you know, you're like, oh, they, it, you know, and that's the best part about that job. I think back of so many clients that I just loved, you know, and yeah. changed me to not be afraid of people with disabilities, and that I can love them and I can hug on them and I right. can do all these things and have so much fun and learn from them, and that was some of my favorite memories. And you and I both, we. We were both close with a guy by the name of Lloyd Brown. Yep. Lloyd yep. was he was an old older person in the population of this. Right. You know, in his when we met him he was probably in his late sixties. Yeah, probably. Had been in the Navy or what something. A, what a story. Yeah. <sighs> but we both of us bonded with that guy. I don't and what it I think what one of the reasons I bonded with him is because I, I looked up to him. For the simple fact that he had the ability to say whatever he was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> and how many people out there in the world today would love to just 
say whatever across mm -hmm. their mouth without hurting anybody, without having to worry about, you know, just, you know, just say it. Even though it was, you know, it's not politically correct, but he would just come out and say it mm -hmm. and call a whoever a whatever and mm -hmm. and he would just say it and uh the the time i i can't even there's so many so many things that i just i laugh and laugh and laugh and he and it, you know he just tell it how it is he was he was a legend and we oh have pictures God. and you and i have been on so many adventures with him let me ask you this though like so lloyd was older and a lot of that population that you and i started with in the 90s uh -huh. were older yep well, a lot of those guys have passed away now. Most I of mean, them. so what is it? What's happening now? I mean, in other words, if they're passing away, and you know they had people have been put out into these group homes, are there people coming back into the system, or are a lot of people staying home you're, with their you're, family? You're not more? seeing it because there's more. the The emphasis is more on family living, staying right. with family. Before, because of that population was older. That generation, when they had a Down syndrome baby or it wasn't normal, they immediately took the baby and right. shipped it right to the home. Right. It, there was no way of sounds or buts. Nowadays, that doesn't happen. They're like, yeah, we'll take care of it. You, you look, I have several um, things that I watch on, on TikTok that I follow and different things. And they're, and they're Down syndrome people that are out there. They're living normal lives and having normal everyday thing. And it's so cool to watch them doing all these things mm -hmm. that and it's sad because if that child had been born 30 years ago that baby that's out here doing you know practicing karate and having dates and doing having a great time they'd be stuck in an institution and and then we'd be taking care of them yeah and, and it's, it's not and that the level anymore. of care when you say taking care has changed generationally uh -huh. so what we did in the 90s is a lot different than what they did in the 50s and 60s and 70s yeah, the how old... they took care of folks with disabilities oh yeah it was so we caught the end the tail of those mm -hmm. then when when we started in the business it was uh, you know really i think positive it was all structured teaching and learning how to you know yeah we were moving forward and and community-based stuff and yeah community-based getting, stuff. getting these guys but it was really hard because we as a as a society institutionalized them and they kept them institutionalized for 20 years and then we step in and, and say like, oh don't guess worry what? No. <laughs> guess what you're not going to be institutionalized yeah. anymore we're, we're sending you out to to the to safe the movie theater yeah you're yeah. going to the movie theater now mm -hmm. well of course how are they going to act they don't know they were treated i'll just say it, they were treated bad yeah They're back bad. then i mean yeah. it was it was it was a, the stories that i just it was just horrible to listen to the old guys tell me the things that they had had they had them do and mm -hmm. you know if they were a biter they pulled their teeth out um you know there was things like they would always tell me why do these guys eat so fast when we'd set down a plate they'd eat <laughs> yeah. it, they eat it like in two seconds and just just gulp it down and a guy told me he said well one of the reasons was because they would set them down at a table and and they would tie the tablecloth around each one of their necks and lay their plate in front of them. And if someone jerked or moved or had a behavior, everybody lost their food. Mm -hmm. So they learned that a, that behavior to eat as super fast as they can because they didn't they want fed. Yeah. So, and that once their plate was gone, they were done. If they got dumped, they were finished. They, mm -hmm. you know, brushed their teeth with in a line, mm -hmm. and with one toothbrush, and went down the line, and they bathed them the same way. They brush their teeth the same way. It, it's amazing. And then, you know, just like us, you know, doing this today, we're they're going to come back 20 years from now and go, oh, my God, those people, what were they thinking? Yeah. It, it just keeps evolving. And so. I like to think it's getting better. It, it has. But then people are going to look back at us and say, what, what were you doing all these therapy groups? And why were you making them do this over and over and over and over again? You know what? You know, right. there's going to be a lot of things. Always. It's going to, and it's just, and that's one thing that's guaranteed is change. And and we learn, and then we change the things we do to try to make it better. Sometimes it's for the worse, but sometimes it's for the better. Just but, think how much has changed in 30 years, though, for you, even. Yeah. So you, you caught the tail end of 
the Dark Ages, yep. probably, yep. is what you yep. would call right. that. Yep. And now, I, I mean, between today and back then, 30 years, is a huge difference. Right, right. You know, and there's very few um, institutions or whatever yep. anymore. Everything is, is completely changed. Um, you know, we used to have structured... Uh, not structured, but uh, like sheltered workshops. You know where these people went to work, and they would shred paper all day for a mm-hmm. for a for a Cheeto. Yep. You know, and we fed them, and they shred paper, and we fed them, and they shred paper, and I, and I always, and I we did it, but looking back, I remember thinking, I seen a chicken at a circus one time, and this chicken, you put a quarter into this machine, and the you put the quarter in the machine and it dropped out this piece of corn and this chicken had to go through this maze to do all these little hoops and jumps <laughs> to get that piece of corn that's what we were doing but the chicken did the chicken know that it was doing all these hoops but right. the chicken knew it was getting a piece of corn and i felt like we were doing the same thing yep. and it was okay though but it was like all right this is what we're supposed to do let's just keep doing it you yeah. know no we didn't know any different right and it was like that's just what you do and then now the sheltered workshops are gone and they don't do that no more because that was too institutionalized and so. what were some of the jobs we used to do so shredding paper mm-hmm. they made branch spreaders mm-hmm. which was essentially a well, piece of uh, wood with two nails on the end of it yeah well, one by one or a, mm-hmm. no maybe a less than that even but a one by one let's say with a nail that that somebody had built these jigs and you put a mm-hmm. a nail each side so that was you know and All right. working for crusties, yep. putting uh, labels on the bags. Labels. Uh, we did stuff for the candle factory, too, when we had yep. that. We were put, making wicks. Um, we labeled lots of jars for the mustard company up here. That's right. Uh, lots of private labeling stuff. Uh, and just a lot of janitorial contracts, shredding contracts. That was the big one, shredding. Went around to all the local businesses, collected their confidential paper. Shred came back and shredded it, and it was it, you know we got paid for it. It was right. a job, right. um, so you know that that was a a step in the right direction. It was a step away from the sheltered workshop. Yeah. So it was kind of getting everybody out and doing things, and I was developing different all kinds of different jobs. But um, yeah, that was that was. I think wild. about like so when we were early 90s going through training they would show videos to show us how far they had made it and they would show videos of the old institutions across the street which would have is now eastern oregon correctional institute but in its infancy you know it was a place where they warehouse people with disabilities right and so that's where it all started so they would show that and then i always think the property there now where the training center was so it went it went it was the what did they call it? The what was the original before it was the prison over there? What did they call that? Just Eastern Oregon. This is a psychiatric center. Psychiatric center. Yeah. Then it went down to then they they sublet it so there was a or split it. There was a smaller psychiatric center and then they moved everybody across the street who was uh, under that MRDD umbrella into these group homes, if you will, and so it's like now you look at the property there and it's all gone like i mean yeah. half of it that but, campus is gone they now, scraped it and now we've got brand new apartments going brand in new there. apartments going there and i think that was there video of the training center will the training center ever yeah. be shown in historically like the psychiatric center was before right. it right and that was our era that's my point is that that was right. our era and it's almost erased it's almost gone they wanted to get rid of it, it it's kind of like everything when everybody left DOTC, it was like all the records, everything, 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 all the documentation we did, everything was just gone, and it was like it never happened, and it was like it was like erased twenty some years is just gone, yeah. and then they went into the group homes and you know none of those charts or anything really followed them nothing, uh, so it just think kinda, about that too where everybody ended up people that we took care of and lived with essentially mm-hmm. for and learned from for so many years where did they go i i didn't even know yeah they just got dispersed in different places and never seen again yep and uh so, so now what is your your um 
clientele that you deal with now, what does that look like going forward? Is that, I hate to say it, is that a steady income of people coming in that are, are having um, criminally, you know? Unfortunately, yeah, it's it's a steady flow. Oh. Yeah, and it's, and in, if you've seen the news lately, there's a, there's a big steady push on mental health and funding and different things, and if you've seen it around in the community, there's a lot more money getting dumped into mental health now because mm -hmm. they're realizing, you know, some of the homelessness and uh, crimes that are being committed kind of relate to mental illness. And there's, they're like, we got to do something about that. So there's a lot of more money being funded and funneled all through these, these places. And we are kind of, you know, we've got a waiting list. I don't know how long it's just, it's a long, there's a lot of people. A waiting um, list for people to, to, to reside there. Yes. And they're coming from the Oregon State Hospital. So mm -hmm. there's several people that are under the PSRB. So if you commit a crime and you have a mental illness prior to the conviction of the crime, you can take the plea bargain. It's not really a plea bargain deal, but you can take the GEI plea. And the problem, there, there's a, the big deal with the GEI plea is if you take the GEI plea, you get the maximum sentence allowed by law. So if you've murdered someone, um, you would typically, you know, they might, you might have your court, whatever trial, uh, you might get 15 years, you know, 10, 20 years. I don't know. Good behavior, 10 years. I don't know, something like that. Well, if the law says that the sentence for murder is 50 years, you automatically get 50 years. If you take that plea. If you take yeah. that plea. Yeah. You are automatically 50. We have several people that are life that, you know, for murder and different different things. So there's a lot of people that, that are never, ever get out. But they can get out from our facility. They just can't get out from... The PSRB. They're always going to be in that yeah. program. If you yeah, will. so they can actually do really well. They can get their shit together and move on, get to a step down. We're, we're considered a step down, and then there it's another step down. So we're secured residential treatment facility. Then there's residential treatment facilities. Difference being locked gates and fences. Mm -hmm. We have locked gates and fences. They do not. So if they, they do everything... Um, we have a there's a there's a guy living here in town that had um, committed a pretty bad crime and got several years for it. He's actually living here in Pendleton. He was able to purchase his house, his car. He has a steady income uh, through the military, and he's doing great but he's still under the PSRB because of his crimes so but he's living on his own but it, it's a lot of hoops he had to jump through a lot of hoops to get to finally get to that point but then there's some people who just aren't never going to get to that point right. because of their mental illness right so they're going to be we had a person when and what's sad about the system is the fact that we've 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 had a few people that we call them timed out. So if they had a let's say they committed a crime of aggravated robbery or something and they got the maximum sentence they got eighteen years. Normally you would get probably six months probation, whatever. Right. But they got eighteen years for it. Because they yeah. Because of their mental illness. So then they take that plea, they do their eighteen years. Well when they when their 18 years is over, we have to cut them loose. They're done. Into jurisdiction. They leave. Whether they're a sex offender, whether they're whatever, it doesn't matter. Out the, out the gate to go. And unfortunately, we let one go that was um, a level, the highest level sex offenders. Uh -oh. And we had to let him go. And it sucked because his chances of, of Reoffending, we're about 110 percent. Oh my god! And he did. Oh, and he already has. Already has. Oh. So now he won't get the GEI plea anymore. 
he'll just be locked up in some kind of facility somewhere off of a ward off of a prison for the rest of his life. Mm. But there's nothing we, you know, no, what do you do? Yep. And it's like a lot of, you're seeing a lot of people. We have a guy now that just, you know, some of these people committed crimes just to get help. Right. You know, because it's unfortunate because if you have a mental illness, you can't get locked up. You can't get help unless you commit a crime. Right. There's a problem. <laughs> you know, there, you know, he went in and robbed us, robbed something and then just basically sat out on the curb and wait for the cops to show up because he knew he was, he was struggling. He needed help mm-hmm. and had and no, get those services. No, there's no services. There was nothing for him. So he knew that if he committed a crime, he would get something. And then that's what happens. Systems broken. Yeah. But you see it getting better. I mean, over your thirty year span, and where do you see it going from here? I mean, it's looking good. It's I think so. It's getting better. It's gotten it's better over our time. Slowly getting better. Policies are slowly changing. Um, we're going into this thing where we what we call a recovery model. And um, you know, with us, it's a lot of correction. We're kind of torn in between correction and recovery. And because we're in a weird spot, because they're criminals, but they have a mental illness. Those two just don't go together real well. Mm-hmm. So it, when we start to get recovery, we're doing great, we're doing great. Well, then they screw up and do something, and then we go back to correction again. And then we're like, okay, let's let them... Okay, then they do, and then they do something dumb again, and then we back to correction again, and so it's just we're in a weird spot. If you were just in mental health, it'd be different. You could focus just on recovery, let them make choices, let them make mistakes. But where we are, we we're basically one of our biggest goals are security and to keep the public safe is what we're supposed to do, and so. We get a lot of high-profile cases from the Valley um, that big news places, you know, big, these people were big on the news when the crimes they committed. And we oftentimes, they ship them to us. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Because they're away from the media. They're away from, we're over here in Eastern Oregon. And they're away from that. They're away from the families, the victims. Boom, move them over here, and we're kind of a quiet little place. Yep. So we kind of contain them into this little world, and that's where they live the rest of their life. That's wild. Yeah. And, and think about this, though. As I was touching on, like, the, the place across the street, uh, it, now it's a prison, but it started out this way. The psychiatric center, when it split, if you look through time, mm-hmm. the psychiatric center's gone. They, they raised it. It's gone. Mm-hmm. And then the training center. It's gone. Physically, there's half of it left, mm-hmm. but it's gone. And then eventually, you know, you, what's there will probably be gone eventually. Oh, I mean, yeah. Oh, for sure. They're going to come in and, and decide that what they're doing is not working. And how weird, though, that the same buildings that you worked at yeah, in one decade, mm-hmm. fast forward, a different decade had barbed wire around it. Yeah. The difference. I'm talking your clientele, and you stayed in the same property. Same everything. Everything, yeah. It's It's just just different state programs. We put locks on the doors and a barbed wire fence around it. Yeah. That's so wild. Same exact facility. And I I left before that happened. So for me, it's so weird to me to think of those homes like that. Because of where they they were their homes. They were their homes. We all were there for dinner or whatever shift, you know. It's homes for a different type of people. Yes. But a big fence and gates around it. It's, yeah. it's it's just weird how it's evolved into something. And then eventually, like I said, when those apartments get all up and around, I don't know what they were thinking with these apartments. I mean, their front door, out their front bay window, they're overlooking the prison. Yep. And in their back, they have a secured residential treatment with sex offenders yeah. in their backyard. For eighteen hundred dollars a month, right? Oh, is that what they're wanting? Yeah, yeah. And several of these are going in. 
all the way around they're, us. Uh, yeah, they're huge. Yeah, I all mean, the way around us. And it's like, I look back and I walk down there and I'm like, and, and it, it's, it's weird. Because I, I look at the property. It was the same way for how many years? Yeah. Never changed. Same building, same everything. All of a sudden, now it's all these new apartments and how everything's changing. It's right. just it's weird. It's weird. And and I hold on to that stuff. And in fact, you know, I look when I drive by those apartments, mm-hmm. I think to myself, there was this little garage, a little two-car garage, and stucco, hip yeah. roof. No, actually a nice little building. I mean, could have been, mm-hmm. but, um, that's where I used to work. Mostly I kept mm-hmm. my, and I had the maintenance guys or the wood shop make me a sign that said transportation department. Yeah. Fast forward many years later, I'm long gone. Nobody knows who I'm there except for the old timers like you. Um, and they're tearing it down yeah. to, to make way for the stuff. And I know the person who's, Somebody calls me and says, you want that sign that you had on that building? And I'm like, hell yes. And so they brought me that sign. So whenever I look at that sign, I think, I mean, it's not a a fancy sign. It's just a simple sign. But I remember when I, I mean, I was a 20, 26 years old when I asked for that sign to be made, you know, or I was young. Yeah. And it was on this building and then now the building's gone. Now there's apartments there. And yeah, but. Here it is in my garage, you know. I, I guess a, that's state property, so it's probably I, illegal. I've got a thing that you could put in here that I've I've kept all these years that you'd probably appreciate. <laughs> uh, do you remember the the structured teaching when we did everything with structured teaching? The boards, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the buttons, the big red buttons that we had to push on the door that said had a recording on it yes. that said goodbye, yeah. I'm leaving the cottage now. Yes. And we had to push that button every time we left yep. to train the residents to push it when they walked out the door right. so, so they could become independent. I still have one of those buttons. I can see them. Big red. And ka-ching. I can yeah. still hear the sound. Ka-ching. And Goodbye. honestly, I was, never, I was never mature enough. How many times did you record something exactly. different? Exactly. Exactly. Always. Over it? Right. I never could. I couldn't help it. It no. drew me in. Yeah. It Change was, the recording. Change the recording. Yeah. yeah. And I haven't. I've left it the same recording. I don't know whose voice. It, a lot of people will hear it, hit it, and will try to think back of whose voice that is. Was it Rhonda Bracken's? Was it right? The you know, people that were working back right, then? and I just cannot put a finger on it. And I want you to listen to it, yeah, and and see if you know who it might be. Right. And it's kind of just very nostalgic that you know I kept a few things, but it is very nostalgic. We we grew up there, yeah, and. And thinking of that, as we narrow down this interview a little bit here, um, the wisdom, like we looked up to Joe and all these guys who had worked in these facilities all these years, and and they had so much, uh, at least the way I describe it, they had so much knowledge about human behavior. And, and as a young person, I learned a lot, and it oh. came in handy oh, through, did. although I didn't stick with that career, I used my skills that mm-hmm. I learned there, how to deal with people oh. and work with people. All I through used life. It, I used it in multiple fields Yeah, to this day. And so... You, you didn't know, even know you were learning anything. No, no. But, I just, like you said, it was, what's this job? Yeah. What yeah. is this? What do yeah. I do? We didn't really the know. smells, everything. Yeah. I was like, what? Okay. It was, we, we just, we had fun and we laughed and we, that's what got me through it. Yeah. Was, you had to have a sense you, of humor. If you didn't have a hit sense of humor, you would not last there. Yeah. You had to. And, you know, a lot of the managers were like, you know, you can't be goofing off. You can't do this. And I'm like, if I if I can't do this. Right. And uh, and a lot of the clients loved us. Oh, yeah. Be- uh, people with sense of humor. And oh, sure. Would, would change. Had fun, you know, yeah. did things. Not at their expense, but with them, you know. or. But like, where I'm going with this is, so Joe, here was Joe and all these old timers that we, you know, we met in the nineties and, and they're gone and now you're that person. Well, that works perfect into every time I end an episode, I always do a thing called spit and wisdom. So when I was growing up, my grandfather used to spit wisdom all the time and he'd say just, you know, those things that are just common sense, you know, like keep your nose clean if it takes both sleeves or, mm-hmm. um, another thing he said all the time. And I use this one all the time with my kids 
don't tell me what you're going to do. Tell me what you've done. Yep. So if you were to spit wisdom, if you could go back in time and you had a couple of minutes to spend with yourself or someone you cared about and they're like, you got a couple minutes to spit some wisdom, what are you going to say? And we think of Joe and all those things, those old timers. And but if you're going to affect someone's life and you've only got a couple <laughs> minutes to say something witty, what are you going to say? I would say immaturity. <laughs> it's what boring people use to describe fun people. That's right. That is beautiful. Because 30 years ago, the same jokes that you and I would tell each other are mm -hmm. still funny now in a certain way. Right. Obviously, we've gotten older and much older, but much older. I don't feel any different. No, you look in the you look in the mirror, you feel different. Yeah, I you don't like your, to look but, at myself. But no, I don't. God, feel, no. I, but I don't feel any different. No. I feel like I'm. I, me and you screwing off and it's running from Kathy Byrne and jumping in the van you know. and hiding and 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 doing the goofy stuff we did and and just the human experiments and the yeah. it, just. Any chance growing we, up, any chance we got to have fun, and that always stuck with me with that with that immaturity. Because how many times have you you're just immature? Yep. And and that's and that's perfect example. That's 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 what boring people describe fun people. You know, that's how mm -hmm. they 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 say they're immature. That is true. And think of all the Christmas parties that you and I. Would get intoxicated oh and do God. Uh, karaoke, especially you. Uh, there was a lot of, yeah, a lot was... of shows that I even after I didn't work there, I came to them. And really, you, I mean, you put that mic in your hand. Uh, yeah, and I, and you know, and and with that, there was a couple. Somebody told me that, you know, some of the things I said when I was doing that MC, you know, oh. I, you know, I. You offended someone. Yeah, 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 obviously, and you know, but you know, it was all in fun. It was. It was all in fun, and, and we it's learned. All we were doing. Yeah, I mean, we're learning from even then. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the world is different now. Oh, it's way different now. Yeah, you got to be really careful what you, you say be really now. Careful. I mean, it's just a different world. And I slip in. up. I slip up sometimes. I do. I do. I catch myself. And I catch myself. and I get. I've been corrected, you know, publicly, and I take it like a man or like a person, you know, like. When I screw up, I know that's okay. I shouldn't have said that. You know, that's right. not how you label something or whatever. But, you know, so whatever. Old skill mentality. Yeah. So, as we finish up, since you brought me in, would yeah. you, uh, wait, actually, let me bring you out. I want you to do the outro. But before you do the outro, real quick, because you are a sponsor of the program. Right, right. Vertical Jigs and Lures. Your son and I mean, t let's talk about that for a second. Oh, tell right. me about what's going on there. And so, Vertical Jigs and Lures is a company that's right here in Pimbleton, Oregon, and it started uh, with a vision with uh, myself and my son, and we kind of took our passion, which was walleye fishing, and we've kind of morphed it into some stuff, and we have thrown ideas at each other on to build a better lure, to build a better stuff, and we kind of went there and you know i've kind of stepped away and he's kind of my son's kind of taken off with it and it's the business is doing real well and he's selling stuff all over the world and um and you guys do a lot of fishing tournaments yeah, and stuff yeah. like that we, i mean so we, that's, that's a it's a lifestyle fishing yeah. you have a so nice that, and that's and, kind of how it started you know what's just fishing and fishing tournaments and stuff and then thinking coming up with ideas and things while we're fishing how to build a better mousetrap yeah it's not it's not about reinventing a mousetrap. It's just making it better. And so that's what we've, what we've done. And we've taken things that are a lot of things that we've recreated that are new that no one else has. And then there's things that, that, uh, you know, we've taken like baits and, and made them prettier, made them mm -hmm. better, made them shinier, made them, you know, more appealing with and, your own knowledge of all, yeah. all these years of fishing and right it's trial and error and practice and just coming up with things that don't work 
and then think coming up with things that do work. How do people buy your stuff? Online. Do you have a website? Yeah, it's uh, www.verticaljigsandlures.com. And you're also on Instagram. because uh, Instagram is huge. Facebook's huge. Uh, you can find all the, the everything that Matthew makes right now that he's pushing out. You can find it at Smitty's Outpost in Hermiston. Uh, all the Griggs department stores and uh, Ranch and Home, they're they're kind of spread and they're all going back east. They're around the they're really big around the Great Lakes, around Ohio where the where the big tournament was. Yep. I, the, I was gonna say, what about this uh, this walleye fishing tournament where people stick stones? Yeah, and actually that's funny because this spring, Matthew actually was invited to fish that same tournament. That was that got busted. Yeah. The loot. He's got the shirts and everything. A guy from Sandusky, Ohio, um, invited him to to be in the tournament in, over there. So he he did it. So he he went into this tournament and got to fish it for two days or three days or whatever in the tournament. So it's kind of weird that you know. Is that a common thing though? People really what? do do the stick stones into no. fish to so when they weigh them at the end of the tournament. No. I mean, who? I mean, I thought it was fake, like it wasn't real. But no, somebody really did that. Yeah, the the and and how how did they get turn? How did they okay. get, get a heads up about it? Okay, here's here's what happened. These those same two people, just like me and my son, fish tournaments. Right. Okay, those same two people have been fishing tournaments for a long time. They've won like three tournaments. They were up for Angler of the Year. Well, you know they cheated the last. Week. They probably <laughs> yeah. did it once. Then they did it again and did it a little bit, got away with it. This time they went they went too far. What they did is they actually started putting more weights in them because they were further behind and they wanted to be angler of the year, which right. is there's big money in it. So they started putting more weights in their in their stomachs or whatever. I mean, that's like an old thing that people thought about doing years ago and I mean people have been doing that for yeah. a thousand you know, how many years cheating. Yes. Um but it doesn't go on that often. I mean, but what happened was when they raised their fish up, because in Ohio, where they did this loot tournament, which a lot of people don't know this, but where we do our tournaments, we catch the fish, we weigh them, and we release them alive back into the river. Mm. So, but in Ohio, where they do these big walleye tournaments, they have a contract that says through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources or whatever. When they catch these fish, they can't release them. They have to take them out, and they put them into a big vat, and they donate them to food banks. Oh. So they don't release these fish. So I think if, you know, here, people aren't going to release a fish that's got a bunch of weights. I mean, it's just going to it's gonna be dead anyway, but they don't care. Because if, if you stuff, if I stuffed weight into a fish and I was fishing a tournament, if I stuffed weight, in, that fish should be dead by the time I weighed it in. A fish would be completely dead, and then you get penalized. Right. So, what I think should happen, and I think we're going to go to it across the country, the weigh-in thing is going to go away. I think it's, I think the future is what they call fish donkey. If you ever look into that, it's called a fish donkey tournament. It's all online. It's a tournament. You go out, and I I like it because you go out and you catch fish. You catch the fish, you put it on a reader board, you take pictures of it, get an official measurement, and then you have so many fish, and you, and you go by length, not weight, and you put it on there. Because most of the time, a fish that's 31 inches weighs right at almost 10 pounds, almost every time. You're, you're talking ounces. So you already know, until you have like five fish limit, you measure them out, then you put them on this thing. Then you have to videotape you releasing the fish back into the water. And it's time dance stamped and everything. So it's recorded live. So everybody that's fishing out there can look at their phone and it goes, oh, so and so just and logged they, one. Yeah, in. they're seeing the whole thing. It's all yeah. happening, unfolding. Yeah. There's no way in. There's no dead fish. Right. Everybody wins. And you're seeing it from the water in, back in the water. Yes. Or, or keeping whatever, yeah. you know. So that's live. I, I would. Because I've fished a lot of July tournaments where the water's warm, and we've caught fish, and we they're alive when we weigh them in. But then when you go try to put them back in the water, a lot of times they they don't make it, and they're 
you, you get it to the way in, there's floating fish everywhere. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, you waste, know, it's, yeah. it's a waste. It sucks. Yeah. And I hate it. But if they went to this fish donkey, they would eliminate the cheating. Right. Sure, you probably have somebody trying to cheat different ways. Like, I mean, there's ways around it. I mean, you could, a buddy could go, he's fishing out there at the same time you are, right. and then swing by your boat and toss you a big old fish. You measure it way. But I mean, come on, that's not going to happen a lot. But if, if there's money involved, <laughs> people will find a way to cheat. Right. I don't care what it is. If there's money, and um, we just never have. I just, I, my conscience, there's no way I well, can no. do it. I, I, mean, I, I would, I would uh, it'd be horrible. I just don't, if I won, I wouldn't. It's not about the money. It's, it's more about the winning to yeah. me. So the money is one thing, but I won. we won that tournament in Washington, and me and Matt were so excited that we got first place. We, we didn't give it. We didn't even. We didn't even care about the money. Right. It's just that you did. We it, got yeah. the notoriety of being first, and that was all that mattered. And then, we, and they were like, "Well, then here's your check." And we're like, "Oh shit, I forgot we were getting a check." Yeah. You know, it was like, "Oh, you know, here's fourteen hundred dollars a piece. Here you go." And we're like, "Doing something you would do for free." Yeah. So, I think I hope people look at this and change the way it's done i think there's there's better ways to do it it's a crazy story it I, is crazy. i couldn't believe it i mean i'm not a big the, fisherman but i'm like really and the reason they got caught they would have got away with it but when they held the fish up to take pictures if you hold the picture and you look they don't look normal their bellies were hanging away and, looked... they, and they looked they were flowing different they looked like they had weights and they just didn't look right and one guy in the audience said i'm gonna call bullshit on that those fish don't look right there's something odd so they complained to the director and the director had no choice but to somebody called him on it so he said okay well we'll just prove it rips open a fish oh shit <laughs> and just imagine being those two guys oh I, I could I, in front of cameras oh, everything what would you do how do you get out of that um <laughs> yeah i mean i'm immediately you blaming lie. you you can't I'm lie. blaming the other guy. Yeah, I'm like, God uh, damn it. <laughs> the only thing you can say is, man, I didn't put them in there. Yeah. I, I Somebody yeah. somebody is must that... have put them in there. I didn't do it. You yeah. know, that's all you could do, you know. But anyway. Well, it was bizarre anyways. Regardless, I got sidetracked. So you already spit wisdom. So I'm going to have you. You did the intro. I'm going to have you do the outro. Okay. And uh, you, we got a plug for Vertical Jigs and Lures. And right. again, I want to touch on this real quick. Your son, he hand paints all those, right? Yes, Matthew uh, paints all of them by hand, every single one of them. Um, and so, yeah, they're all custom created, every That's, single one. And I mean, it, I've looked at some of the the paintings, and I'm you know, on it's the, it's phenomenal. And I'm like, whoa, yeah, it's phenomenal because it's, it's air um, um, airbrush, airbrush, yeah, and it's all airbrush, and there's all kinds of different techniques he uses, and um, they're very very exquisite i mean it's probably and i'm not being biased or anything but i but if you look in if you're in the wall if you're a walleye fisherman and you look in the walleye world and you look at different baits and stuff you won't find any 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 more any baits out there with that much detail and that's, that's why he sells so many yeah. of them but they're you know they're 20 some bucks a piece yeah but it's, and he's selling it's, them as fast as he can make them it's funny how art shows its way sure in all different forms i just don't you know, when I tell him, you know, just don't, you don't outsource anything. Right. You know, out, nobody outsourced anything for quality. Right. Exactly. Don't do it. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show. It's oh, it's been, been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. It's been wild. I'm going to have you on again, I think. Oh, good. Because I think we can. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff. I to think talk you about. have a, more to talk about. Oh, so, yeah. So uh, if you don't mind, just. Go ahead and read us out. All right. I want to thank tonight's guests, listeners, and sponsors. Bill Murphy Roofing, Wandering Wizard Concepts, Vertical Jigs and Lures, DLC Photo Photography, The Shop, Diesel Fuel Filter Kits.com, History Hunters and Firearm Antiquities, Metal. Nice job. Metal by Mora and the John P. Salter Foundation. All sponsors can be found online and at most 
social media outlets. Music provided by Big Steve and the Trainwreck. And some others. And some others. And that's a wrap. Be sure to catch the next episode. Until then, keep your nose clean if it takes both Both sleeves. sleeves. And say nice things about me because I'm gone. Gone. All right.